You know, I wanted to get into the business of intellectuals in this country that you've written about so much. I think in one of your books you said that uh, a mass society like this is not conducive to producing an effective or powerful intellectual group, but then in, the, in your last book you say the intellectual is really coming into his own, a kind of a rule in this country. Uh, are, you, are you contradicting yourself here? No, or? I'm not contradicting myself. You know, since Sputnik, this is how history is made. Sputnik, what is Sputnik? A little gimmick. You know, the nature of a society is determined by the direction into which energies, ambitions flow. In other words, by the tilt of the social landscape. Yeah. Now, up to recently in this country, the tilt was towards business. Business? Absolutely. No matter where you started, you wound up as a businessman. Many potential poets and philosophers became businessmen, and as I point out in my book, I think the Promethean nature of American business was due to this fact, you know, that it was built not by conventional businessmen, but by potential philosophers and poets. You know, if you take a potential philosopher and make him a businessman, he acts in a beautiful way. To him, all action is the same. He can be a prize fighter, a yeah. prize promoter today, he's going to be a manufacturer tomorrow, he's going to... business is business. Action is the same thing there. Put some and kind of soul into it, doesn't he? Not only this, he will collate and combine factories, mines, uh, uh, railroads, the way that a philosopher uh, generalizes ideas. And so many, you know, what the intellectual is becoming a more important person now, more than ever before. Imagine, uh, Henry James tells uh, that he and his brother William in their, in their childhood were ashamed to admit that their father was a philosopher and an author rather than a businessman. And right now the kids on, on the campus of Berkeley would be ashamed to admit that their father was a businessman, and just a grubbing businessman. They would be proud, or, or take it the other way. Suppose you lined up, uh, 20 years ago, you lined up a businessman, and a painter, a poet, a sculptor, a professor, and you got yourself a beautiful girl to pick a husband. Chances are she would have picked the businessman. Right now, don't be so sure. She might even pick the poet, Maybe. especially if they got a Google high, you know? <laughs> Mr. Hoffer, you seem to have a fear about the rise of intellectuals in political, political life and power. Why, why are you so frightened of it? Well, I'll tell you. First of all, I ought to tell you that I have no, <coughs> no grievance against the intellectual. All that I know about the intellectual is what I read in history, what, and what I saw, how I saw them before, you know, in our time. And I'm convinced that the intellectuals as a, as a type, as a group, see, are more corrupted by power than any other human type. It's, it's disconcerting, Mr. Severi, to realize that power, that businessmen, uh, generals even, I mean, soldiers, uh, manufacturers, are less corrupted by power than intellectuals. And in my new book there, I think I elaborate again and again, and I give an explanation why, you know. You take a, a, a conventional manufacturer, he starts right if you obey, huh? but not the intellectual. He doesn't want just to obey. He wants you to get out of the need and praise the one who makes you love what you hate and hate what you love. In other words, whenever the intellectuals are in power, there's soul raping going on. Is that true in this country? I think it's true in Russia. Well, in this country, the intellectuals are not in power. See? Now, take the simple thing. People ask me, how about Muslims in this country? And I tell them that the Muslims haven't got a chance for the simple reason that mass movements are not started by the masses. Mass movements are started by intellectuals. They always are. Yeah. yeah. And in this country, the intellectuals has not neither status, nor prestige, nor influence. I mean, we, the common people, are not impressed by the intellectuals. You ought to see, not really hated, but as a disdain for the pencil pusher. We have seen the pencil pushers working even on the waterfront. And we actually define uh, efficiency by the small number of pencil pushers, you know. How many, if, if you ask me, what do I call an efficient uh, society? I would say the ratio between the supervisory, between the office personnel and the producing person. The smaller the amount of supervision, the better. The better, the healthier, the more vigorous the society. And you know, where the highest. The highest supervisor uh, personnel is where the intellectuals are in power, in the communist country. There, half of the population is supervising the other half. Now I'm gonna ask you a question. Who comes next after the communists? Come on. After the communists? Yeah. I bet you know. 
I can think of countries like Uruguay that are not communist, yeah. where half of them are yeah. telling the other people. Actually, Britain. Imagine that. Yeah. Britain. In other words, wherever the intellectual are, intellectuals are in power, you'll have an enormous uh, pollution of the uh, supervisory personnel. And why? Because they have a tremendous contempt for the masses. The intellectual cannot operate unless he's convinced that the masses are lazy, incompetent, dishonest, that you have to breathe down their neck, that you have to watch them all the time. And this is where we are sitting pretty, Mr. Severi, because the masses perform only if you leave them alone, like we. That's where we are at our best. Yes, but in, in Britain, a great deal of this pencil-pushing bureaucracy grew right out of the labor movement. People who were laborers. That's right. And you and know they why? Became worse they than have the these aristocratic ideas. Everybody in Britain, the moment he gets anywhere, wants to be an aristocrat. Although he says that he contemptuous of the aristocrat, but there is a worship to class consciousness there you think, that you can get away. Even the communists behave like aristocrats. There. Even anybody. Of course, the communists are aristocrats from the word go. But this is our strength. The ability to work without supervision. This tremendous, widely diffused competence. Let me tell you a story. During the Depression, a construction company had to build a, a road in the San Bernardino Mountains. And the man who was in charge, uh, instead of calling up an employment, employment agency and asking for so many men, he sent down two empty trucks to Skidder. And anybody who could climb up on that truck was hired, even if he had only one leg. And once the two trucks were full, they put in the tailgates, they drove us out to the San Bernardino Mountains, they dumped us on the side of the hill. The company had only one man on the job, and he didn't even open his mouth. We found their bundles of equipment and supplies, and then we started to sort ourselves out. Mr. Severide, whenever I think of that thing there, I, it, it's the most glorious uh, experience I ever had. We had so many carpenters, so many blacksmiths, so many cooks, so many foremen, so many men who could drive a bulldozer, handle a jackhammer, yeah. so many cooks. We put up the tent. Put up the cook shack, the toilet, the shower bath, the cook supper. Next morning, went out and started to build the road. If we had to write the constitution, there would have been somebody here who knew all the answers and were foreign, and we could, we could have built America. We were just a, a shovel full of flying scoop off the pavement of Skid Row. Yet we could have built America on the side of the hill in the San Bernardino Mountains. Now, you show me anywhere in the world with such a diffuse competence. It's fantastic. In other words, when I talk about the Americans being as skilled people, I don't mean on technical skills. I mean social and political skills. You know, this has been my definition always. Uh, the vigor of the society to, should be gauged by its ability to get along without outstanding leaders. When I said that at the University of Stanford, all the young intellectuals were up in arms. They ran after me after I finished and they said, Mr. Hofer, the vigor of a society should be gauged by its ability to produce great leaders. And then I stood there and I said, brother, this is just what happened. Precisely a society that can get along without leaders is the one that's producing leaders. Look at, in the case of Truman. You remember that picture you, when he was warning? All the great brains standing around and wondering who, look who is being sworn in as a president. Now, Truman, the Trumans are a dime a dozen in this country. You can almost close your eyes, reach over the side to make a man a president, he'll turn out to be Truman. Show me any society on heaven or on earth that could do like a thing like that. I mean, our potential leaders, they are terrific, it's breathtaking. You mean they're everywhere? Everywhere. Now, Mr. Hoffer, in Washington, where I work, there's a great deal of talk and controversy about intellectuals in the federal government, the writers that have been in and out of government. Yeah. Do you think they contribute anything to governing this country? Well, I don't go, I don't go in that, but I know they haven't got the power. The power is in the hand of a Johnson, and Johnson is not an intellectual, although he has been a school teacher, you know. Johnson is one of us, yes. and this is why I have faith in him. You see, the intellectuals are important people, I suppose. After all, they produce all our books, paint all our paintings, and all sculpture, and, and our science. Where would we be without our intellectuals? And I say, give them, pamper them, pet them, give them everything they want, but no power, no power! You see, the, the problem that faces a modern society is how to canalize the, the energies of the intellectual and yet not give him power. How to make and keep him a paper tiger. Get it? That's what, what you have to do. Why do they hate Johnson? Oh, well, it's just it's, they can't stand the common American. 
And of course, look at our American intellectuals, real intellectuals and two-bit intellectuals. Look everywhere in the world, Africa, Asia, Europe. Intellectuals are making history. Intellectuals are statesmen. Intellectuals are even generals. Intellectuals are running things. And here in America, the intellectuals have no power. And so, they are mad. They are mad. Now, I told you that there's been a change in the tilt of the social landscape right now. Yeah. People who should be wheeling and dealing on Wall Street or should be building industrial empires are now throwing their weight around on the campus. They're throwing their way up the academic ladder. They're throwing their way, their weight around in, in artistic and uh, literary uh, cliques. And you won't believe it, but making history is a substitute for making a million dollars, you know? And the joke is, I'm old enough, you know? At 65, I know the whole cycle. The whole circle, running full. You try to make history at 20, and then when you are 40, you are actually trying, you will be trying to make a million dollars on Wall Street. I could tell you instances. You know, on the waterfront, the richest longshoremen are all economists. They are all... The richest longshoremen. Absolutely. Actually, from my own experience, I would say that the Communist Party in the United States is a vehicle for transforming true believers into successful real estate events. <laughs> And, and there is a certain regularity. If you were Stalinist at 20, chances are you're going to be a, a real estate dealer at 40. If you are a Trotskyite at 20, you'll probably be a successful professor of sociology at 40, and you'll be sneering at his young, stupid intellectual. And recently, you know, a few Maoists came to see me, and I had fun with them. Uh, Wait a minute, Maoists? Yeah, <coughs> they are worshipping Mao. Of, of China, yeah. China. <laughs> and I, I had real fun with them. I just told them what I told you. I said, I know what the Stalinists are going to be. I know what the Trotskyists are going to be. But what are the Maoists going to be? And I said, let me predict your future. You are going to be laundry man. You know, there's only one step from brainwashing to laundry watching. <laughs>